an early model telephone. You might recognize it from old movies or television. Not everyone had one, but if you did, you didn't own it. The government did, meaning you rented it from the telephone company, which was government regulated. So, not so surprisingly, when it came to rates and services, one size fit all, very democratic. And as for any extras or options, dial zero. Operator, number please. Uh, sorry. At one time, this streamlined beauty was considered nothing short of a miracle. So much so that except for a few cosmetic changes, it remained the same for decades, generations. Imagine having the same phone that's in your pocket or purse 50 years from now. You can't. So why was it caught in such a time warp? Simple. There wasn't any competition. It wasn't until the government stepped aside and allowed private businesses to compete for the telephone dollar that this weighty invention emerged in a comparatively short amount of time into this. Even this. That's the power of competition. TV is another example. When I was a kid, there were three channels. Like the phone, television was government regulated. Flash forward to today. Subtract a few regulations. Add a cable and a whole lot of people who will entertain you if you let them sell you stuff. And you've got what? Again, the power of competition. In case you're wondering, I am here to talk about space. The next era of space flight, to be exact. So why all the telephone and TV business? Because in just the same way, the more the space industry can escape government confines and open up to commercial competition, the more likely it is that in your lifetime, manned space flight could include you. And not necessarily just as a scientist or astronaut, but as a private citizen out to celebrate a special birthday or looking for an adventurous weekend getaway. I don't guarantee it'll be as far-reaching or effortless as in the imaginary world where I work. This is Captain Archer of the Starship Enterprise. Please respond. It's not your grandfather's space anymore. The final frontier is getting new pioneers. What makes this next era of space activity so different is that it's being run by entrepreneurs and private companies rather than governments. This competition is establishing space as a new, highly profitable marketplace. Actually, space exploration began in the 1950s under highly competitive circumstances. Unfortunately, it was a war, the Cold War, some called it, between the two most powerful nations on Earth, the United States and Russia. A war of threats and displays of power, one of the most famous occurring in 1957, when America was caught off guard by Sputnik, a basketball-sized Soviet-made satellite that began orbiting the planet, beeping an ominous signal to Americans that they were neither the first nor the technological leaders in space. President Eisenhower responded by starting NASA, which retaliated by launching a U.S. satellite called Explorer, and the race for space was on. By 1961, a few heroic dogs and chimpanzees later, the competing superpowers began sending men into space. Short test flights, then longer and longer orbits, prompting President Kennedy to set the stakes for the competition even higher. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And in 1969, right on schedule, American Neil Armstrong landed on the moon and the intense race for space was over. Curiously, ironically, the same government that provided the vision and money for the moon mission still couldn't provide its people a more modern telephone. Although, by that time, in their defense, they had just added area codes. So, what was next for the future of manned spaceflight? Looking ahead from 1969, it seemed as though it had no limits. Looking back, 
Some might say it's been underwhelming. Colonel Richard Searfoss, veteran of three space shuttle missions, explains. Hi, Scott. You know, it was a, an incredible privilege for me to uh, pilot two shuttle flights, command a third. At the same time, uh, over the course of that uh, nine years in the astronaut corps, I recognize that just by the very nature of being a government organization, things sometimes more, move more slowly. It's more difficult to get things accomplished. It's just the nature of the beast. It's no secret that when the space race ended, the competitive edge went dull, and the government reverted to business as usual, never recapturing the space program's early momentum. How to restore it? Maybe the answer is to go back 100 years to the beginning of the airline industry. It's hard to imagine that the friendly skies started with a dare of sorts, a small contest with a large cash prize. Raymond Ortigue, a French hotel owner, so admired the pilots of World War I that in 1919, he offered $25,000. In today's money, that's like $1 million to the first flyboy who could make a nonstop flight across the Atlantic Ocean. At first, there were no entrants. No one had the combination of technology, guts, and game until 1927, when American Charles Lindbergh signed up for the challenge. New York to Paris nonstop, he said. If airplanes could do it, there's no limit to the future of aviation. And even speculated that transoceanic flights could someday even turn a profit. So he took off, flying alone over the cold black ocean in a plane so small and cockpit so cramped that he had to use a mirror to see out the window. There was no way of communicating, so tension was high on both sides of the Atlantic until his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, touched down in Paris. 33 hours later, and the world collectively cheered the daring feat. A new era of aviation had begun, and a new industry born. One that has pumped billions into the economy by making it possible to affordably fly anywhere while eating, sleeping, and watching movies. If a cash prize was critical in the development of the airline industry, perhaps a similar prize could launch a space travel industry. That was the thinking of Peter Diamandis. Like myself and millions of kids in the 1960s, he grew up watching the Gemini and Apollo programs and became fascinated with space travel. But by the 1980s and 1990s, he thought we could be doing so much more. Inspired by the Ortigue and Lindbergh story, he created the Ansari X Prize. My name is Anusha Ansari, and I've been fascinated and fixated on space all my life. I was inspired by the vision of Dr. Peter Diamandis. He wanted to revolutionize personal space flight industry, and I believed in that mission. So my family and I decided to join him in this revolution, and we became the title sponsors of the Ansari X Prize. It offered a $10 million award to the first private team that launched a manned craft with a three-person capacity 100 kilometers into space, not once, but twice within two weeks, to prove its reliability. They were 26 teams from seven different nations that competed. As you can see, the designs are unconventional. Could one of these teams, with no government help or resources, actually solve problems of affordable spaceflight that the $100 billion spent on the space shuttle had failed to solve? Why would anyone expect solutions from them? And then again, why not? Nine years ago, I first read about this thing called the X Prize, and I read about it in uh, Space News or one of the publications in the industry, and I virtually laughed to myself, yeah, that'll happen in my lifetime. Well, as it ended up just a few years later, after I left government service, had the opportunity to get connected with the X Prize, eventually became the chief judge for the X Prize competition. I was out on the desert in uh, Mojave, California, on uh, October 4th of, of 2004 with about 10,000 other people. Now these were the faithful, the people that just absolutely love space and, and are excited about something moving forward in the private sector and saw the incredible possibilities. As the chief judge for the venture, I was um, 
responsible along with my team to verify the requirements so that 50 years from now they could look back at the historical record and see that yes this historical event actually did happen. As with all prizes there can only be one winner and the winner of the Ansari X Prize was White Knight and Spaceship One. White Knight carries Spaceship One under its belly and flies it to the height of about 50,000 feet. That's when Spaceship One fires up its rockets, which carries it over the limits. Holy crap, that was close! 62 and a half miles. Its re-entry to Earth was inspired by the simple science of a badminton birdie, of all things, like a feather whirling down to Earth. It was beautiful. We could see on the jumbotrons, and we saw Spaceship One glide down and land safely. On that second flight, they blasted so far beyond the altitude required, and it was a slam dunk that I was as happy as anyone there to to announce that yes, they actually achieved the requirements. Uh, the X Prize has been won, and we're marching down a new path to sending humans to space. Fantastic day. Exactly. It completely changed and revolutionized the way public perceives space flight. XCOR Aerospace. There's a little company I work with out in the Mojave Desert called XCOR Aerospace, which is one of the great leaders of uh, preparing us to fly humans on a commercial basis to suborbital space. Uh, I'm their test pilot and uh, helping them move forward with the design. XCOR has an agreement to sell rides on this vehicle with Space Adventures, an adventure tourism company. Actually, Space Adventures is the company responsible for making my dream come true. They are the ones who arranged my 11-day mission to the International Space Station. It was an unbelievable experience. What I was able to do as the first private space explorer and the first uh, astronaut of Iranian descent was to share my experience through an interactive blog while I was uh, training at the space station. Over 25 million people from all over the world visited the space blog and were fascinated by reading the details of my daily life and my emotions. If you're interested in space, go to anushaansari.com and read the blog. You know, it's very intriguing to me how, from a business perspective, space tourism makes all kinds of sense. And that's the direction we're heading now as private capital flows into this new infant industry and vehicles are being designed and built as we speak. Is it that close to becoming a reality? Hello, Space Tourism Society, Red Planet Ventures. John Spencer, founder and president of the Space Tourism Society, can give you the big picture. Um, Mars is a little bit cold, actually, and there's no oxygen, but other than that, it's a pretty nice place. I started the Space Tourism Society in 1996 because I saw there was a need to start organizing our efforts to create a space tourism movement and then a space tourism industry. And it's worked very well over the last 10 years, bringing some of the brightest and the bravest together to brainstorm and create businesses and network around the world uh, with this great idea of space tourism. Current projects are the development of a Mars-themed resort and hotel here on Earth in the Mojave Desert, north of Los Angeles. As an immersive simulation, you'll be able to go there in a few years and pretend you're an astronaut on Mars. I'm also developing orbital space cruise ships, modeled after ocean cruise ships, moon resorts, sports stadiums on the moon, and I'm advising with Bob Bigelow on his space hotel project. When the Space Tourism Society was first founded, the laugh factor was very, very high. Everyone laughed at this concept, but progressively through the years, as, as it's become closer to reality, it is no longer a laughing matter. In fact, it's very serious business, and uh, people are investing an awful lot of money to make it happen. Of course, there are critics that call space tourism trivial, of no economic value, a waste of money. A waste of money? Have they realized that government space agencies haven't reduced the cost of space travel from when the first men went up in 1961? 1961, when phones still used operators and TVs only had three channels. I think I need to lie down. C 
seriously. Private space tourism is going to have a huge effect. And it isn't going to be just a small part of future space activity, but the main one. Then when you spin off all the scientific, technical financing, sales, and promotion opportunities, you're talking about a lot of fantastic jobs coming available. In a generation or so, the Earth's resources will be challenged, and we know space houses options and solutions. But we can only access the bounty of space, whether it's for iron, our inspiration, energy, or enjoyment, if we can get there and back quickly, safely, and economically. Can we? The likelihood is looking closer than ever. If enthusiastic entrepreneurs with imaginative minds continue to enter the game, there's no limit to who can take part and how much we all can benefit. Maybe in the future, outer space will be called everyone's space. Is it for you?